for those who uh, uh, the uh, those who have begun uh, to uh, check in here. Um, looks like we've got some people that will be coming in throughout this, but that's fine. I can catch up as we go. Um, if you know Chris Scanlon's voice, this isn't it. I'm Mike Marco, and I'll be doing the webinars. Chris is under the weather, and we're from Minnesota, so under the weather is is awful. But uh, fortunately, I'll have an opportunity to do this for you today. If you don't know me, I've been at Capital for 15 years in the industry, for over 30. I do uh, little 60-second videos called A Minute with Mike. If you haven't found those, if you go to www.aminutewith Mike.com. Don't miss the R. You may be on a political site, but a minute with Mike.com will bring you to the Capital YouTube channel. Um, it's also where you'll find a copy of this webinar that will be posted afterwards if you need to pull additional information off there. Fortunately, I have done this training several times at CEDIA, just in a little longer format, so we'll try to get things uh, in tight for you in timing. I'm new. Uh, to go to webinars, so bear with me if we have any issues on that side, but um, not new to the material and the training side of it, so that should be good. So we got lots of stuff to cover, and we're going to move really fast as we go through this. And uh, because of what we have in content, I'm going to answer all the questions at the end, because hopefully some of them will be covered as we go through things. Um, so uh, for your questions, you'll see a little box for uh, posting questions. Just put those in there, and then at the end, I will um, go through those and get the answers for you. So with that, um, we're uh, ready to go here. So hopefully everybody's screen hear me OK, and uh, we're going to get started on this. First, just a, a quick idea of what we're going to cover today. Uh, first is, you know, why bother with this stuff anyway? Why should we do uh, selling commercial audio? Some of the concepts in dealing with residential versus commercial and a few other aspects um, of where things are at. The terminology and what I call the gazatas and gazintas, you know, what's going in one spot and out another. Some things of signal level type terminations that you may have heard of some of those items and some of that may have concerned you a little bit. The components of the system, we're going to start at the really source amplifier end and work our way out to the speakers. And uh, application design, uh, just a, a moment, we'll talk about a, a couple aspects of that. And then we'll finish with what kind of steps that you can look at uh, next in this whole process and uh, making our way through it. So you can see there's a lot that we have to cover. So um, let's get going. If you get lost in where I'm at, kind of in the top of the green section, it will tell you up there where we're at. So why should we bother with this? I mean, obviously, a chance to add profit and grow your business. Interesting, you should be able to leverage your knowledge and uh, experience that you have, uh, relationships you may have if you're in the residential side. It may be that there's folks that uh, have businesses that you can uh, work with on the product so that it gives you a chance uh, to be able to uh, present more opportunity to them. And I think you can keep the risk pretty low. I'm very sensitive to looking at risk for the dealers we serve. and. Um, if you follow some basic rules, uh, you can keep this pretty straightforward. And uh, here at Capital, your rep can always help you work your way through those aspects of it also. So let's talk about how it compares with residential versus commercial. Um, sorry, I didn't have time to have more uh, questions beginning, but I'm going to assume some of you have not done commercial at all, or some of you have done it slightly, or you wouldn't be here. So. Um, First, in, in looking at, you know, you're talking about areas, uh, typically instead of uh, multiple rooms, we're dealing sometimes with a larger area. Uh, the type of listening that's being done um, is, is different. We're not really listening for imaging. We're trying to get even distribution of sound. Uh, we have to look at a little bit more of, um, you know, how we're sending that, that audio uh, to the two individuals. Um, Selection is a little different because of uh, there's some things in mixing where we may be combining uh, somebody speaking along with music and, and we have a little bit different instead of switching directly and controls a little bit different than what we're going to see on that side of it. But the main things I think that to concentrate on are looking at uh, we're no longer thinking about like in, in a home theater and, and image type issues. We're just trying to make sure we get even coverage on an area where people can hear what the spoken word is. 
Um, how will you sell it? I mean, residential, in my view, is a little bit more emotional in the commercial. Think about their bottom line. That's a lot of times where they're at. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they don't want to spend money, but keep in mind that they're not doing this just because they want the place to rock and roll. If it's a bar, they want to sell more liquor. Uh, that's how they're making money. So having more base sometimes helps achieve their having the place sound like it's rocking can help them uh, achieve more sales. Uh, I know in retail environments there's studies done and the percentage of increase of sales is tremendous when there's better sound um, audio being reproduced in the store. That's why it happens in those nicer stores that are out. Well, let's talk about some of the differences in this um, uh, products and one of them is talking about speakers. A lot of times we're working with low impedance speakers and in our experience by that I mean four, six, eight ohm speakers. And overall if you have one speaker in a system, the amplifier seeing a load of eight ohms, if we put a couple of them, that gets cut in half. It's four ohms. Uh, if we put three of them, we have two ohm. If we get a whole pile of them, like many times we have in commercial, it's like a dead short to the amplifier. And what that does is can cause some real issues overall uh, with what's taking place in the, uh, in the amplifier. So most of the amplifiers want to deal with a maximum of a four ohm load. Um, some of them will go down to two ohm. So you can see that with running multiple speakers, it could be an issue. And, and therein lies some huge benefit in dealing with 70 volt. Uh, sometimes, by the way, you'll see, and I'm just going to call it all 70 volt, you'll see 25V or 25 volt. Sometimes that is considered because 70 volt may have to go in conduit on the site that you're on, and if that's required, you can run the system. It's 25 volt. Typically, the speakers operate fine. You have to make sure you have an amplifier that will meet that, but that's why you sometimes will see that. Sometimes you'll see 100 or 140 volt. Um, which is, uh, again, operating all off the same principle. Uh, we're not going to do the math, but uh, what it comes down to is where 70 volt is interesting is it's analogous to high voltage power grid where they're taking a couple hundred thousand volts that they can run in relatively small wire and then it comes to a transformer out in the pole or in a post or in the ground and it's going to bring that to 240 volts or 120 to be able to be brought into your home and be usable. By having the higher voltage, we have much less loss. We can run lower gauge wires, and we don't have to worry about all of those impedance issues I was talking about with speakers where we get close to a dead short with 70 volt that helps clear that part out. Um, so, and each speaker will know what uh, its power consumption is, and the amplifier is going to put out a constant output to the speakers that are out there. We change the level that goes there, but they're all operating at 70 volt. So what are the advantages of 70 volt? A large number of speakers uh, on one amplifier. Lower ga wire gauges, um, we're dealing with attenuators or volume controls, pretty simple. You can operate it on one speaker or a whole line of speakers. Easy amplifier sizing calculations. We know the speakers, we know what level we want to have them at, we can determine what power level we need and not have to worry about it being uh, uh, under or overpowered. And it's just simpler. So my view is anytime you're working with more than two speakers, I would consider 70 volt in the system. It's in, in a commercial level. It's going to make life a whole lot easier. The other thing a lot of people think because they hear some of these cheap, uh, you know, $15 in-ceiling speakers that are 70 volt and they're concerned about the quality of sound. You have some great sounding 70 volt speakers that we have available in several of the lines that are out there. Uh, real quick, kind of what's taking place, and this is kind of helpful to think about if I, I like this diagram because we have output from our uh, amplifier on the left side of it and then it's going to a transformer that's on each speaker that steps it down. Again, it was like that high voltage um, power coming to our house. It's coming out at a higher voltage. There's a transformer at the speaker that brings it to usable level uh, for the system. You can see the way this is wired, uh, kind of wired in a bus type configuration and the uh, uh, that's really, if you look at that, it is a parallel circuit. It's wiring them all together um, in what we're doing. But uh, the uh, 70 volt is looking at a, a uh, uh, 
parallel circuit that you're working with. Real quickly, there's different taps on the speaker, and that allows us to get more output at the speaker. For example, this transformer may have one, five, and 10 watt wires or a dial that would set it for you, and basically that just determines how much of the transformer is getting used and therefore how much power is being translated to the speaker. You'll notice in this diagram, it's interesting, the first speaker is uh, set and tapped at 10 watts, because you can see the lower 10W down there. The second speaker's tapped at one watt. Third speaker's tapped at five watts. So down the same line, we can get different level from the same speaker by putting the tap in without using any other volume controls. And sometimes that can be advantageous um, in setting up a system. Normally, they're all tapped at the same kind of level. So. Uh, let's get into the components. So there's a bit about the 70 volt where it differs a little bit and, and where that might make sense. So let's get into the components that we need to use and we'll start obviously ahead of the amplifier we have some source but we're going to skip that at, at this particular point and we're going to talk about amplifiers themselves. Uh, typically we're going to see 70 or 25 volts. Some of them will also have a 4 8 ohm output um, on it. What you need to think about on these is normally we're looking at one channel because we're not running stereo. Everything is summed stereo or mono. I like summed stereo because it sounds like it's uh, higher fidelity. Uh, but uh, consider how many channels you need. You need a channel per source zone, not necessarily per zone of area because you may be able to adjust levels with a uh, attenuator there. And uh, we have to look at wattage output. So normally we're looking at it's a 70 volt. How many channels do we need to work with? We'll figure that out in a moment. And at wattage that's required. To look at sizing it, we want to make sure we have 15 to 20 percent headroom over the requirements of the speakers. So basically what we do is we uh, get the speakers and we'll talk in a moment about how we figure what level they're set at. But we take the tap setting, let's say we have 10 speakers and they're tapped at 4 watts each. That's telling us we've got 40 watts of total power requirement. We divide that by 0.8 approximately. That's giving us 20% headroom. And that's telling us we need a 50 watt amp to do it. Uh, if we had a 60 watt amp, that would give us 48 usable watts. So again, very straightforward. We take the, the number of speakers times the wattage. It gives us a total requirement. And we need 15 to 20% headroom or divided by 0.8 or 0.85 to give you what your uh, headroom is going to be. In the uh, uh, product categories, uh, we deal with a variety of lines. A couple of the ones shown in JBL Commercial. Um, it, it's basically a, a new badge for a lot of the crown equipment shifted over to that in their smaller size. So some of the controls in this are very uh, um, typical for what someone's seen in the past. Interesting in the in the uh, uh, top picture below the knobs there where you see the inputs, you'll see some three wire connections there. The little green plug goes in, um, a Phoenix plug or you might want to call it. You'll see a, a red and green, or excuse me, red and white where it sums left and right for you. So if you're putting in stereo, it sums those together. The very bottom picture you can see there, that one's got eight different inputs in it. And each input could be a line, it could be mic, it could be standard uh, auxiliary left, right that it's putting together for you. So these, uh, this particular item is a combination mixer amplifier. Uh, so it's taking both the input and producing power for the unit to be able to get that combined together for you. Uh, Atlas has another a group of products, these uh, PHD, which is uh, Push Here Diagnostic, there's a little button on it, and that's kind of cool because it allows you to be able to hook up the speakers, and if something was cross-wired or you had a speaker that was accidentally in an 8-ohm position, so 70 volt, um, a yellow light will come on telling you you have an error. A green light says everything's good. Uh, these are interesting that they go up to 200 and 400 watts, which some of the mixer amplifier combinations don't get that big in other manufacturers. So this is kind of slick where you can get a lot of power if you need and get it all in one box. Uh, they also have a nifty little uh, control that you can CAT5 connect to it to give you source and volume control off of CAT5. Uh, Russ Sound has a controller that they have out also in that area. 
uh, components and speaker wire. We got to have speaker coming into the or speakers uh, connected. Normally, you don't want to get too many on a line, but technically, you could if you had 50 speakers, put them all on one run, uh, all parallel together. But diagnostics and finding a short is a trouble. So I usually look to six to eight speakers to a run and uh, try to allow you to have a little easier diagnostics with it. Uh, we're using two conductor stranded. I typically typically recommend 16 gauge. You know, people say, how far can we go? Uh, this is a great indication. This is if you had 10% loss of power through the wire, how far you could go. So you can see on a 16 gauge, if we had speakers that were tapped lower power, let's say they're tapped at five watts each, and you have 10 of them, you can go 1,400 feet on that wire. So you can see you can get pretty long runs on these um, in, in doing that. Uh, there's also a tool uh, available on um, Crown Audio. And by the way, there's a lot of information, slides, and some of these things you'll see, sites and other things available where you're going to want to pull off the information. So you're not trying to scratch these down real quickly. Uh, again, if you came in later, the webinar will be posted um, up on the Capitol uh, YouTube uh, homepage there so that you'll be able to see this uh, within a couple days here um, to be able to get this additional information because it's going to come past your screen pretty quick. But anyway, here's one where you can put in the wattage, length of wire, what voltage you're running the gauge, and it will tell you what the loss is on that. Uh, typically, we like to keep that loss at a half dB or less, uh, which is half decibel is going to be about 10%. Next part of that, we go to a volume control or an attenuator. These go in line, similar to what you may have dealt with in standard 8-ohm uh, product, and they can handle that part for you. Um, on the uh, bottom right, there are some of these that are uh, controlled back to the amplifier via CAT5. The other ones are in line where they're connected to the speaker wire. Uh, think about location of volume controls. Um, sometimes they may be in a room. Sometimes they may be behind a bar. They may be at the head end. Um, you have to think a little bit more where they're at. They're not necessarily going to be convenient for somebody to reach in this particular case. Let's look at speakers. Just want you to see a bunch of the different options that can exist in there. You'll see a variety of these in-ceiling speakers that top one to the right with the can next to it. That's real typical. Those are typically used for paging or speech. They're used for music, but you know, with an $18 speaker, it's marginal what you're getting there. There are some other great speakers available. In wall, in ceiling, you'll see the one that a tile bridge can, or a tile section can come out and go into that position. There's a JBL in that uh, top left, which you can see in two-way and a port on it to give you uh, additional performance. Surface mount, on top right you'll see a horn and, and uh, below that another you'll see uh, below that kind of a, a wall type unit, maybe a school application. Um, some of the others that are bracketed speakers uh, down middle center you'll see a horn loaded with a big port in it. That one can rotate one direction or the other depending if the speaker is standing upright or on its side. Um, again, some of them have a, a U bracket around them. Others will have a, a ball mount at the back that uh, JBL uses for giving you positioning on it. Another uh, speaker type is getting this a little bigger uh, format, but uh, you'll see in that bottom left corner is the, the can that's suspended, and then the line drawing kind of shows how that speaker goes in. That's a coaxial speaker. Um, you can see a pretty big crossover, uh, big drivers, 10 inch, 12 inch, and it's hard to tell in that picture, but in the uh, right side, so this is a multi-purpose room. If you look up in the, in the ceiling area, you'll see the black boxes, so they have those cans. Um, mounted up in there, and I'll tell you, that is one rock and uh, gym or uh, worship center, they use it for that as part of it. You also see some other sound um, acoustic uh, treatments that they have as part of that. Uh, the uh, another subwoofers, they're not just for residential. You can put them in ceiling here. They can go uh, in a corner. Some of them sit on the floor. Some are amplified. Some are, are not. They are available 70 volts. Some are uh, uh, 8 ohm. So a bunch of different options there. There are many cases where the subwoofers will operate at 4, 8 ohm. We won't get into all the reasons why, but sometimes they will operate on that basis, um, depending on what kind of run length we're dealing with. 
another type of speaker. These are kind of specialty type things. Um, on the left, in that uh, bottom left blue, is actually a hanging speaker for sound masking. The other two are pendants that come down, stadium speakers. The top right had a bunch of those going in a drag strip recently, and they will get decibel levels enough to get your ears to bleed, so you got to be careful with those, but you can get high power. Hard to tell in that picture, that thing's about two feet square in the opening, so it gets quite big. Bottom right is an array speaker that is used in many times um, to give uh, performance. They call it constant beam technology that JBL Pro utilizes. So there's a quick idea of some of the components and things you see. So let's take a, a look at the application categories and how this stuff kind of comes together. Um, I, I kind of break them into a, a bunch of categories of high-level, mid-level background, foreground, which is kind of bar, uh, background, pay, background or possibly paging and restaurant might have a large area indoor in a warehouse or auditorium. Thinking of outdoor, do a lot of ball fields, that type of thing. Um, sound masking is another whole category if you run into it. Some will call it white noise or pink noise. Basically, it gives the ability to have some privacy, um, and, and that's another application that can be used. Um, let's take a look at what you need to be able uh, to put the design together. And this is a part you'll probably want to come back to and look again on this to pull some notes. Uh, consider the venue for these kind of things. And some of this will make it obvious as you pull together, but purpose, is it foreground, is it background? What style of speaker are we looking with that's going to be fitting? What kind of volume level is required? Is this just going to be low background so people can easily talk over it, or is it going to be rocking so that people feel like there's a, a lot of activity going on? Aesthetics, is it seen, is it hidden? Base requirement. Intelligibility, if we have spoken word uh, microphones involved and people being in a video, we have to watch intelligibility. Uh, where is it controlled, local or is it head end? Is this single or multi zone? Are there different sources? You know, is there a game going to be going on in the bar area, but they want to keep uh, more mellow uh, classical music going on in the, in the restaurant area? Uh, so there, there may be different uh, zones that are involved in an application. And is there paging um, overall or maybe by a, a zone area? So let's take a look at what do we need to be able to put to put the design together. Well, first thing, and, and any if, if you talk to any of the reps here to help you with the design, these are the questions we're going to be asking, and these are the ones you want to have answers to. What are the dimensions of the room? So we get a feel for how big this is. What's the ceiling height? and the type, and we have to know the space above if we're doing sound masking, because that's going to tell us what our dispersion is. In many of the cases in these applications, speakers are going in the ceiling or coming from above. They are typically not in the walls, which is why you don't see many options there. Is this existing or new construction that we're working with? Is it plenum or non-plenum? If you're not familiar with that terminology, plenum is basically the airspace above uh, the tiles in a commercial site. And if that is open, sometimes it's ducted. Sometimes if it is open and it's drawing air back through the vents, uh, we have to be careful in the wire used uh, for codes in case there was fire. Ambient sound level. How loud is it in there under normal conditions? And there's some tools we can help you with, cheap things that you can get for free to load on your phone to get a feel for levels. Room acoustics, um, and probably one of the most important ones that I feel is getting the budget. We've got to have a feel for where the customers, uh, where the customers add on these things. So here's the steps. We're going to get the uh, information we need for design requirements. From that, we figure out speaker needs and settings. And uh, basically, um, that's going to be telling us how many speakers we need because of the size of the area, et cetera, and the ambient level or, or how loud it is and how much louder we need to get over that. Um, is going to help us determine what the, the settings are in the speakers. And we'll help you sort through that. Unfortunately, not enough time to get into the detail of that at this point. But uh, you can determine, just to point out, if you have a customer that's at a particular level and you want to achieve a certain decibel level, you can very easily tell because the speakers will be rated and you can determine how much power is required and hence the tap setting to achieve the levels that you're looking for. 
uh, source needs, um, and we have to keep in mind, is there any kind of paging that's being used, muting or jukebox or something of that nature that might be uh, going on, or are they just going to be streaming music? Be careful. There are the music police uh, you do if you have to have music licensed if it's being replayed in a, another facility, even if it's standard radio uh, or streaming or not. Uh, control needs. Are there zones? Um, what, what kind of sources are going into those zones and what kind of volume do we need to need to control levels in uh, different rooms, for example. Mixer controller input needs. Well, now that we know what kind of um, uh, sources and things they have, we have an idea of what we're going to need on our mixer controller, be it built into the amplifier or a separate mixer. So that's going to say, OK, we have one um, streaming source, and we have a microphone for a paging table that's going to be involved. And those are the only sources we have. Or maybe there's a different source. Another source is going to be direct TV audio. Um, and we uh, may have to add that to the mix for what we're looking at. Then from there, we look at the amplifier. So the amplifier, again, we've figured out the speaker. We determine how much power needs are required. And hence, the amplifier will then, uh, or how much power we need is determined. And how many channels. Again, each channel, we could send, um, for example, if we had three different rooms, they all have the same source. We may be able to control the, the levels in each one of those rooms independently and may not need a separate channel. However. If we have more than one source, each source area will need its own channel. And you'll find that commercial amplifiers, many of them are single channel, some are double. Uh, there are some four channel, eight channel. They can be stacked up. There's a variety of ways that that might happen. Um, the amplifier power needs, um, I guess we talked about channel and power needs is determined from the, the number of speakers and their uh, needs. And then the final uh, catch-all additional considerations that might be taking place. So those are the eight steps. Now, obviously, I went through that rather quickly. But we go through those steps. We know the size of the room, the height, um, the kind of levels they want to achieve, at least approximately. We can very quickly determine what are the materials we need to be able to put this together and, and the wiring uh, structure to get it done. Um, a couple different things in applications. Uh, in industrial, uh, there are several areas, small office, warehouse, gyms, uh, outdoor ball field. I guess I'll put those into the industrial kind of application. There's a ton in this area. You know, Smaller office, um, multi-unit operatories for dental offices, clinics, things of that nature. Conference rooms, they might need some reinforcement there. Um, education rooms, uh, restaurant and bars, probably the largest opportunity. Um, if you're passing on those, certainly take a look at There's a great opportunity on that side. And again, a lot of um, a good uh, opportunity there and profitability that can exist. Um, some resources, again, obviously you won't be able to write these down quickly, but I just want to let you know what's in there. Uh, JBL Pro does a bunch of things in white papers that can give you additional information. Bogan has some general audio and paging design stuff. That's where that one table was from earlier. Atlas Sound has a lot of good uh, general audio information up on their support side of the site. Uh, sure Microphone is great in, in looking at, at design and things of that nature. They're also great on the phone for helping you go through that, as well as Atlas, Bogan, and JBL Pro can help. Crown has some very neat stuff. Uh, that's where the one other uh, kind of interactive um, uh, loss uh, line loss that was taking place on wire way back when that we talked about. That's where that was pulled from. And they have a lot of other tools in there. Uh, Zone Pro uh, by DBX is a neat piece for controlling equipment. It works a lot like multi-room control. Viking Electronics has a variety of problem solvers. Like, for example, if you need to get a contact closure off audio, they have some things to do it. Want to know about mixing and, and uh, maybe bringing microphones into, into uh, music or uh, other live, and most of this we're not dealing with live, so it's a lot easier. But um, Soundcraft has some great information on their mixers. Um, for spacing and locations, um, Bogan has some basic guidelines. Atlas has a speaker selector tool. Probably the strongest tools that I think that are out there are JBL Pro 
has some downloads on this and one's called Distributed System Design Software DSD and the other is Ceiling Speaker Configurator. Those two are great tools. I'm going to quick show you what the what the uh, app looks like. It's a really small application. I mean, real short download. But for example, on this, you can see you can. You, it kind of brings you through steps. How's this being used? Is it music? Is it paging? Is it both? And then it it, it steps you into um, what type of um, application is this going into and from there it may recommend particular speakers for you and the tap settings that would be used for it. Normally you're just putting in, you can see on that slide to the right and then the left side of it it says configuration bases, music only, high foreground music and approximate square footage and, and ceiling height are the only parts that you really put in and it's saying okay here's some speakers and tap settings that would typically be used in this application, then you got to figure, well, how many of them do you put in? This is really slick. So now we go back to getting our information. We had the length and the width of the room and the ceiling height. We can change the listener height if they're standing or seated. In this case, it's defaulted at four feet if you see that where it says listener height. We put in a speaker type. It has a drop-down list of all our speakers. We can put a tap setting, although that's not critical at this point. And then there's a neat thing. It says, uh, you know, in square array, which typically we're dealing with a rectangular room, we can set what the overlap is, which is basically how even that sound is going to be in the room. Edge to edge or 4.3 dB means we're going to have a little bit of a hole because 3 dB is um, able to be heard or more. Uh, if you see minimum overlap, two decibel can give you very smooth coverage. So if you're moving from one spot to another within an area or if you're sitting at a large table with eight people, you don't have it real loud at one side of the table and quieter at the other with that overlap. You put that information in, click OK, and it puts this little drawing that you see on the right there and it's showing in this case eight speakers are used in this particular application to get the coverage that was listed on it. You'll see lots of neat information in there. Expected level of variation is listed, what the minimum or recommended amplifier power wattage is saying 72 watts minimum to be able to use. And what's really slick is you can go in and make a quick change on that and be able to change the spacing of the speakers, the size of the room, um, if you want more overlap to determine what it's going to do for your overall uh, needs in the speaker. So again, great tool and, and we can help you work your way um, through that side of it. So. Um, We've been uh, moving through a stuff, and, and, and forgive me, I, I get gusts up to about 150 miles an hour when I go through this, but um, just to kind of go back and look at this, if some of this looks like it makes sense and, and you can kind of see where the 70 volt fits in, where the speakers and components are in there, look for a commercial opportunity. Just talking to some of your customers and saying, hey, you know, we're doing uh, TVs for your location, uh, your conference room, your bar, or whatever. Uh, there's some areas we might be able to help in the in the uh, sound or audio side of it. So start putting that part of it. Uh, get the design requirements information. Again, we're going to help you go through it, but you know, if you have a plan or you have the room size itself, get that length of the room, width of the room, get the ceiling height, uh, get some of those other requirements put together, and we'll help you work out laying out the system. And this stuff again lays out very logical. We'll we'll check the design, make sure that we have things right. And then the simple uh, part, just sell it and install the system um, and make lots of money in the process of it. But again, I, I want to clarify that you can do this without having a ton of risk um, to be able to pull it together. Again, if we have the information, we know what we can produce, we can tell a customer we can make it this loud in this area and have this even a coverage for this amount of money and know that you can produce that in a, in a very mechanical way. So um, that is uh, the end of what I have for presentation, and I'm going to go uh, open things up for questions here and see what we've got, as I haven't been looking at any of that uh, through this to see what we've got. So stand by as I find my way through things here. Uh, all right. Let's see what we've got first here. I I think you meant to put a minimum of four ohm load, right? 
Yeah, if you're if you're working with low impedance standard speakers, I'm I'm saying yes, the amplifiers generally will handle a um, a four ohm load. Some will go to two ohm. So again, I didn't want to spend a lot of time in there, but essentially what it does is I run an analogy to your amplifier being like a, a, a big water pump and the speakers out there are a nozzle at the end of the hose, which a hose being your wire, so to speak. So we get a, a hose that's big enough wire on it and if we have a nozzle on that has a some resistance to the to the water coming out, and that would be a standard eight ohm loan, the pump's running fine, everything works good. Now we take that that uh, valve that, or that nozzle at the end and we open it up wider. We're now letting more flow come out, the pump starts to start to accelerate a little bit and it begins to get more power in most cases and that's what happens with many amplifiers when we go to a lower load. If we take that nozzle and open it wide, wide open and we open it too far, the pump may begin to spin too fast, overheat and blow up, which is the same thing that will happen to an amplifier. So back to the 4 ohm load, 8 ohm most amplifiers are fine. Some do not want any more than one speaker on it. And again, if you're dealing with those speakers, you have to do something to get that impedance held at a level area. And again, that's where 70 volt, we don't have to worry about any of those loads at the bottom line. If you're working with other speakers in it, again, that's where I was saying, two two speakers will give a 4 ohm load, two 8 ohm speakers will give a 4 ohm load to an amplifier and that is um, uh, generally the maximum that they want to operate out of. Uh, you mentioned customer budget. How do you recommend getting what the customer's budget is? What is the best way to obtain a budget number from the customer? Well, interesting you ask that. Um, Normally, in the presentation, when I have time, I go into this one, so I'll tell you my approach to it. Now, I've been in the industry, and I remember I said earlier, you picked it up uh, 35 years in that range. I'm getting old. Somewhere in the midst of the training, I don't remember who it was. This was a Zig Ziglar deal or where it was, but somebody had given this approach, and I tried it, and it actually worked. I mean, obviously, yes, the customer, in many cases, they're trying to hide what their budget number is that they're working with because they're afraid you're going to spend all their money. But in this stuff, you'll find pretty quickly, I mean, in an in-sealing speaker, we could go from $18 dealer cost to, you know, 300 bucks, depending on what they may want to do. So we have a large range to try to guess from. My suggestion is to ask the customer what kind of budget range that they have for that project complete. And uh, if they give you a number, wonderful. If they don't, um, if you have a little preparation ahead of time, so you have some idea of what's involved, I suggest trying this. Um, now, you have to be careful in this that you have a number that's very low and very high. What you're going to do is give the customer a, a two number options, one that's way below possible range and one that's way too high of a possible range. Let's say, for example, you're estimating this is probably a $5,000 job to be able to complete labor parts material. And you've asked the customer what kind of budget and they said, I don't know uh, where I'm at, I don't know anything about it. You ask them a second time and they say, well, I'm still not sure and maybe you ask them a third time and they say, well, just give me a bunch of quotes and we'll see if, if any of those work, you know, how they do that once in a while. I would say, you know, after you've pursued a few times and they've kind of pushed the edge, they say, well, what you know again keeping in mind you think this is a five thousand dollar job i would throw out this question do you think this are you looking to spend five hundred bucks uh, twenty thousand what, what kind of range and it's amazing how often they'll blurt out an answer now again if you said three to seven thousand there's not enough spread put something absurdly low because they know five hundred dollars isn't going to do it and they're scared to death if they're spending twenty thousand so throw a wide range um, and see if that works amazingly enough first time I tried that, I was a little uncomfortable, and then I found that it actually worked in a number of people. So there's a long answer to a short question. Somebody asked, uh, what's a dead short? Well, basically, uh, that would be like taking the wires on the other end of the speaker where the speaker's connected um, and just tying them together is what I'm talking about is a dead short. If we get too many speakers together, that's what the amplifier is essentially seeing. So uh, that's what I meant by a dead short. Sorry about that. Can you explain the difference between a zone and a channel? Oh, good question. I, um, in, in, uh, when I'm speaking about zones, I'm speaking about on the project or the site itself. 
how many areas are we um, going to be working with. And that may or may not relate to the channels. So let's say, again, we'll take the bar restaurant. And let's say there is a bar area. They have um, a, another smaller section of restaurant, and they have a larger area or possibly even a private room. So there could be four different zones that you need to deal with. How many channels on it usually relates to what you have to do with sources. So if you're running the same source to all of those, one channel may be able to do it. However, each zone or area is probably going to need its own level control. Obviously, the bar will be louder than where people are normally eating. Um, so that that's kind of where those will relate a bit. If you got that same scenario I was just talking about and they wanted different sources, for example, the two restaurant areas are separated enough from the bar that you don't get a lot of bleed over and sound. You could have one zone for the two restaurant um, areas on it for a single source. You could have the bar having its own source and you could have the private room having its own source because they might bring their own music, for example, and some places will do that when they rent private rooms. In that case, I would need three channels because each one of those zones would have its own source that it would have to work with. And again, when, when we're thinking of uh, home audio, we're always thinking of pairs. So, uh, you know, if you're looking at it's not terribly dissimilar from that. We may have a, a bathroom, a master bedroom, a kitchen, and a family room all being zones. And technically, we have a paired channel for each one of those areas to give them independent control of music, assuming each one of those areas is separate. So that's kind of what's um, in on that. How do your brands compare with ElectroVoice amps and speakers uh, in the 70 volt line? They're way better. They must be because we sell them. I know that. Um, I mean, there's a lot of good stuff that's out there. We have lines in the amplifier side. We do Atlas, uh, Crown, JBL, Commercial, QSC. Am I forgetting anyone? Bogan. Um, in speakers, we're doing Bogan. We're doing JBL Pro. Uh, there are some amplified speakers in QSC, um, uh, Atlas speakers. Um, so there's there's several options we have on that side of it. Uh, we think the stuff, we have it for a reason. We think it fits well. We know it well on how to put together, and it's all been reliable, and that's a key that we like in, in working with the different uh, manufacturers we've chosen to represent. Uh, any considerations or recommendations for a conference room that will be piping slash streaming either music or video audio into a conference room? Let me look at it again. Any consideration or recommendations for a um, uh, recommendations for a conference room that will be piping or streaming either into a conference room? Uh, one of the things in in the conference rooms that have to be um, dealt with is usually they're not real big. Uh, we got to look at what's coming in, and they may also have something that's coming. Um, coming off of the um, uh, you know the source control tying to, to the video side of it. Uh, what I would recommend on that one, if you're working with a rep at Capital, talk to them specifically. If you're not, uh, call into uh, our 1-800 install. It's an easy number to remember, 800-467-8255, and uh, have them uh, connect you with somebody in sales that can um, help work through things on that side of the specifics there. Are there any negative consequences to the speakers by driving a 70 volt system with an 8 ohm amplifier? Um, yeah, you won't get any sound out of them. Um, I mean, let's see. I mean, the negative consequences, I guess, depending on how that will you blow up the speaker. If you run for a long enough period of time, you're going to have issues there. But if something happens where you had it off in position, it's you're not going to be able to hear it. Um, uh, but yeah, if you run it for some period of time, uh, the amplifier isn't going to like that. But it isn't like if you had it accidentally set that you're going to blow everything up instantly. When the gain control is changed on the 70 volt amplifier, is the output wattage being lowered to all your speakers? Um, yeah, the the uh, so when the gain is changed on the main amp and we had all the speakers in one line, yes, they will all go up and down together. You can on that line, and again, it's kind of difficult um, to explain verbally, but you could have 
uh, the one amplifier outputting to two speakers over here that have a volume control on those two speakers and then you could have the line going down and dropping a volume control ahead of each speaker on the other side and you could kind of independently control those speakers to get the uh, output levels that you need out of that. One of my clients has blown four consecutive amps going into the going into the step up transformer. Everything seems to be wired correctly. Any suggestions on where to look for the problem? I prefer to do that one offline. Um, again, uh, 800 install. I'm at 167. I, or, or your rep here can try to help work through that. Remind me that you're in the webinar and we can take a look at that. Any difference in system design when dealing with large buildings like hotels, 600 units, need speakers in hallways and common areas, etc. cetera? Uh, yes. Um, I mean, if, if you're dealing with hallways and that are the differences, I mean, other than you have to keep in mind your length of what you're dealing with because now you're typically getting into hundreds of feet. But, you know, again, most of those are running very low level. Budget's a consideration. So uh, some of the better hotels will put in better quality speakers so that they actually sound pretty decent. Um, and that is, uh, you know, an, an option that can be considered in it. But a lot of the same principles take place. It depends on what kind of coverage. When you're walking down the hall, typically you hear music louder and then it's quieter, 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 louder, louder, louder as you go across the, the speakers and um, the, uh, uh, you know, that variance in how close the speakers are is really a determination of what kind of dollars they want to put into the project. But overall, we're still, still dealing with the same kind of principles overall and what we're working with. And again, we can help you on the design on that. What's the best way to select uh, attenuator wattage? Is it strictly based on the total wattage of the speakers connected to it? Well, that's a good question because some people ask, is the, is the volume control considered in that wattage calculation? Your assumption is correct. As long as the wattage of the volume control is rated higher than the total of the wattage of speakers connected, you are okay. For example, if you have uh, four speakers tapped at 10 watts each, you need a 50 watt or a 100 watt uh, attenuator on that. Um, typically, we have a few, Atlas has a 10, a 50, a 100 watt attenuator uh, that's available, so you do have to keep the wattage below. So then the question comes up, what if I have 150 watts of speakers on that line? You're going to have to control that at the amplifier level or at some other uh, preamp. Uh, source level to be able to deal with it because the attenuator, or I guess you could split the speakers if the wiring would allow you to get your levels below that. Uh, for intelligibility, uh, question mark, sorry, long after the question, intelligibility, how clearly we can understand the spoken word. So uh, if we're uh, giving a presentation in a room, intelligibility is important so that everyone can hear specifically what is being said and that may affect the type of speakers and the placement of those speakers that everyone can hear the word and understand what is being said. Are your products price and internet protected? Many times clients find items we offer cheaper on the internet. Well, I'll tell you, you know, it's tough because there's almost everything's on the internet somewhere, uh, legal or, or not legal. We overall try to choose products that give you the best margin potential in what you're working with, but unfortunately some of these things are um, available through guys either authorized or unauthorized online. It really kind of depends on the, the product specifically you're looking at. Several of the things we work with have pretty good protection on them and margin on it is generally uh, pretty good in, in what's existing there, but again, your rep here could help work through it. But uh, I mean, some of the some of the products um, are available online at other locations. Some of them are are not found very readily. So in many cases, you can steer customers to the products, or we can help you steer customers to products. You can make sure you can maintain your margin while achieving the requirements for the job. Any recommendations for inexpensive multi-zone control with two sources? Um, most of the equipment I've use seems to set up for small number of zones and a large number of sources. Um, in the, uh, I mean, in, in multi, 
multi-room controller, multi-zone controller is a piece called um, Zone Pro by DBX, which is incredibly reasonable for what it does. That it's strictly preamp level, no amplification, but gives you a ton of control. Takes a little bit of programming and setup, but is a good way to be able to do it. Um, and looking at uh, the atlas we showed earlier, if you're part of the presentation, then uh, th there was a PhD models do have a remote source control, um, but it is uh, generally one uh, source that you're dealing with in that, uh, or I mean, one zone that you're dealing with in that particular area. But there are solutions in there to be able to do it, and, and we can help you find the ones that will best meet the needs. Well, man, uh, if you're able to, to hang in here, thank you so much for staying. I hit the end of the questions. I know that's a lot of material to try to absorb, and your head's probably ready to explode. But um, contact us. We can help go through it. You can see the uh, webinar again online um, if you uh, go to the Capital YouTube channel, and you'll see my smiling face in a minute with Mike, and, and down below that, you will see previous webinars we've had and this one again that will give you the additional information so you can pause it and take notes or whatever else that you might be, want to be able to pull from it. And certainly, uh, if you're working with Capital, your rep here, all the reps here are experienced and they can help in, in working with you on the design to make sure that you're getting things right. If you get something more uh, detailed, we'll, we'll know where to direct you. If, if there's uh, other questions that are uh, getting real deep, we can help uh, assist in those areas. We'd love it. Uh, for an opportunity to be able to help you grow that side of the business. Let us know where we can be of help. Thanks again for your time. I really appreciate it. I know that's precious. And uh, we appreciate your business, those of you doing business with us, and any others, uh, we hope uh, a chance to be able to work with you on this or other areas. Have a great day.